Hi, everyone. It's Jen. We hope you enjoy this special episode all about me. But if you're looking for more, check out our Patreon page where you can subscribe at tiers two and above to get our detour series, which has tons of extras, including a extended version of this episode with over 15 minutes of extra content that will hit on February 16th, 2023. So check us out there. But most importantly, thank you so much for listening. On this episode of Common Mystics, we discuss me, Jennifer James. I'm Jill Stanley. We're psychics. We're sisters. We are common mystics. We find extraordinary stories in ordinary places. But today we're talking all about me. Today it's Jennifer on the hot seat. Eek. I know, it's awkward. I know, it's so awkward. We're just going to jump right in. We're just going to do it. We're doing it. Jennifer... You and I often refer to our upbringing on our podcast, right? We talk about how the paranormal and spiritual metaphysical things were the environment in which we grew up. But some people may be surprised about your relationship and your insights regarding the paranormal from a very young age. Can you describe that to me? Sure. You know, for me, it was really complicated because – Hashtag complicated. Right? Because I was – when I was born, mom and dad lived in grandma's four-flat building. Mm-hmm. So the first five years of my life while I lived in that building, grandma, Irina, was my primary caregiver. Right. I was with her every single day. And she was spiritual AF. Oh my gosh. She she lived her spirituality. Everything she did was seeped in not only prayer, but mysticism. But how did you digest that? It was normal. It was normal. It was normal for me. And I spent every day with grandma. So did you feel, although you were immersed in this environment, did you feel like congruent to it? Do you feel like you were a part of it, that you had that same? Oh, no, not at all. No, grandma was special. Grandma, I understood very early on, had like a hotline to God. Like she Mm. was the one to go to. Um, if I ever needed anything, it was just it was just known that grandma had connections in heaven. And when you have a, a problem, you go to grandma, you know, so she I was have kind of pull. immersed. What's that? She did have the pull. She did she have the pull. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. So that's that's my earliest. My earliest experiences were about not about me and my spirituality, but just grandma is spiritual is like mystical AF and she has connections. So anytime you need anything, grandma is your go-to or my go-to. Got it. So you weren't like doing, you weren't fouling in her footsteps, doing the same kind of rituals. You were just like, grandma, I need something, hook it up. And she would. Exactly. I got it. Got it. Yes. So you knew that there was a possibility, there was an awareness there, but you weren't doing it for yourself. Oh, I wasn't doing it for myself. To me, it was all about grandma. Grandma was the one with the power. And when I was in her presence, I felt that power, but it wasn't mine. It was just because I was in her presence. Then eventually, you moved to Forest Park with um, your younger siblings as yes. they were coming along, yes. as the stork were bringing them to you. Yes. And <laughs> and so now you were away from that mysticism. Yeah. Well, yes and no. I was away from grandma's sense of spiritual protection. Oh, okay. So you were like to the wolves is what it sounds like. Yes. When we moved to Forest Park – Not long after that, that's when mom and dad's marriage really started to hit the rocks in a way that I felt. And I was in, I was only in second grade when they separated and dad moved out of the house. And you were born Mm -hmm. when I was seven. Mm -hmm. So, so question. So if you imagine, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So question. So you are living in grandma's house in a nice cocoon of grandma love and magic. Yeah. You move to Forest Park 
Um, your siblings are coming along fast and furious. And are you tapping into anything that you um, experience with grandma, like we described in my in my episode of self soothing, because that sounds like you went yeah, through some shit yeah. at that time. Were you doing any of that? That's a really good question. My experience was a lot different from yours because, as the oldest of four, mm-hmm. uh, as the oldest daughter of a mother who then had to go to work and was really very absent in the house because she had to be because there was this whole situation with the divorce and dad not supporting us monetarily Mm -hmm. and the fight over money and then mom having to work two and three jobs Mm -hmm. and then when she was home having to sleep Mm -hmm. you know so I had to be a mother a caregiver (laughs) I had to be a caregiver, and I did my best with you girls. <laughs> you are a mother at a very young age. <laughs> yeah. So my my tendency was to be very practical. Got you it. Know, be very left brained. You were on a mission because you had to keep the house together. I was on a. Mi- I recognized that this was bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> this complete situation is bullshit. It is chaos. It is bullshit. And the one area... You're not saying paranormal is bullshit. You think our our circumstances. I'm saying the chaos yes. growing up yeah. without parenting. Yes. Growing up in a house without limits, without rules, without parenting. I mean, we not, we, mm-hmm. we were poor. We show, oh my. And Jennifer, we ate like raccoons out of garbage bags of apple fritters that were thrown out at the local bakery. You can totally edit this out, but I need to tell you, last night when we were playing marbles at my in-law's house, they had apple fritters. And I no. swear, every time I see an apple fritter, I feel like I'm being punked. <laughs> like, people are being like, have it. And I'm I like, know. No, they they brought apple it. fritters to work the other day, and it, it I just I felt nauseous. I'm like, oh. It's a trigger. Who eats Explain apple- to people why. <laughs> well, I know this is off topic, but please explain to people why apple fritters are a trigger for us. Because the bakery would throw out the old apple fritters and our aunt worked at the bakery and she would bring literally Santa sized garbage bags full of old apple fritters. And that's what we ate. Like I said, like raccoons in an alley, we ate out of this trash bag. And mm-hmm. I be, I remember that's where we got apples. our fruit. That's where we that's had our fruit. We I remember fruit. picking the apples out of the fritters. Just nasty. This is a Patreon add-on, by oh, the way. Totally. We'll add the apple fritters. Totally. Yeah. No, 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 no. So oh. um, it was just chaos because there were no rules. There was no parenting. And if there were rules, is because I tried to enforce them on my sisters in the house. And it didn't work. Not only that. When you would talk to grandma about some of the real struggles you were having on adulting when you were like seven or eight, she would tell you the best way out was to do your very best in school. So not only were you trying to run the household at seven or eight, but you were also super focused on your scholastics, right? You were like, oh, yeah, that is true. School I was successful in school. I was always successful in school. I could I could be the best Mm -hmm. in school. And I recognized that home sucks and nothing is (laughs) – nothing is – it just makes me feel so – I want to scratch when I talk about it. I know. I was just scratching my head. There was – it makes me itch. There's, there was no structure. There was no order. There was no fairness. Oh, there was no fairness. There was no peace. There was nothing like that at home. And I, I got it all from school. And so I would, I would take my books and I would take my homework and I would go into my room and I would close my door and I would shut out the chaos at a certain extent when I realized that I couldn't control the house anymore. You know, I would shut my door and I would just study and write and do my homework. And that was my, I want to say it was an escape mm-hmm. in a way, um, but that's that was my way out. You know, it was my way out of this poverty and this experience that was so unpleasant to me. I was going to get out of it by going to college and going to school. 
So would it be fair to say that during those turbulent years, you really didn't have any Fs to give about the parent? Like that was not on your radar? It was something that mom was very into. And honestly, I felt like it was kind of foolish. Like that was not me. When she was having the psychics to the house, she'd be like, Jennifer, do you want to get a reading? And I, I wasn't into it. I'm like, no, I'm cool. Like I'm in, ch- I'm in charge of my future. I don't mm. need to pay this psychic fifty dollars to tell me what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen because I'm going to make it happen. Like that was my mentality. Now, all that being said, in spite of yourself during those times, did you have moments that seemed to be spirit intervention at all? Did you recognize spirit in your life, even though you weren't looking for it and exercising that part of yourself? At a young age? I think in hindsight, I can see those moments. Um, for example, after we moved to Forest Park, when my when my world fell apart because I lost grandma, mm. and we moved to Forest Park, and the marriage was rocky, right? There was this moment that I remember so distinctly today, like it was yesterday, where it was a beautiful fall day outside and dad was there and he was mowing the lawn and we were doing yard work together and I was outside with him and I was helping him and there was a radio on and the song on the radio was Sunshine on My Shoulders by John Denver. Aww. And I remember watching dad and just being filled with the knowledge that this moment would never again be replicated in my life that dad was like going to be gone like there would never be another moment where I had mom and dad in the same place in the same space you know in the house and um, I just started crying I just started Mm -hmm. crying with that realization that I was so happy in that moment that dad was being a dad and he was home and mom was being a mom and um, I remember I started crying and he came over to me and he was confused and he's like, why are you crying? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know why I'm crying. Because you didn't want to tell him. And then mom came out and she's like, what did you, what did you, what did you do with her? What did you do to her? And he's like, I didn't do anything to her. But I mean, I don't know. I remembered that moment over the years and, and looking back, it, it does seem like that was a sense of knowing that came over me almost mm. maybe a warning a warning that things were going to change. Or prepare, preparing yourself. Yeah. yeah. It, are there any other moments, hopefully not so sad? The other thing that that I came to recognize, and at the time I would not have attributed this to spirit, but I came to recognize that if I was writing a paper or if I was studying and I was stuck, if I took a break from it, and did something else, like went for a walk or went to the mall or whatever it was. If, if I did something else, it was almost like it would move from the active problem solving part of my brain to like the back burner. And then when I came back to it, it would just sort itself out. It would just be there. It would be all mapped out for me. Do you know what I mean? In your, in your mind's eyes. In, in, mm hmm. In my mind. So when I came back to the paper, I'd be like, oh, I know exactly how I need to work this transition. Or I know exactly how to describe this, you know, event. Go ahead. That reminds me of Edward Casey. Him taking a beat, him going to sleep on something and waking up and knowing the answers. Right. You you have a podcast. You are a producer, an editor. And a co-host of a paranormal podcast. What was the process that got you to this space where you're actively using your paranormal ability, your awarenesses? And how does that look? Well, Jill, it's <laughs> it's been a journey. Tell me. <laughs> I was shut off, really, truly. I was shut off for most mm-hmm. of my young adult You had life. shit to do. You were raising three I, kids. You had to go to college. I, right, exactly. It wasn't until grandma died. When grandma died. Well, question. Yeah. Before grandma died, were you, like, when I think of your process, I have a visual of someone getting into water, like, 
tiptoe, like a toe in at a time. When was the first time that you were like, I'm going to dabble in this? Was it after grandma died? I'm not asking because I know I'm asking just because I'm trying to make sense of it. I think that there were like I was curious like about the tarot. Um, I was curious about, you know, psychics. I wasn't really curious about mediumship. I mean, I guess I was curious, but I never even entertained the notion that I could communicate myself to, with myself to spirits. So I was always kind of curious, but it was always like not something that I thought was, quote unquote, real for me. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it was part of my yeah, crazy family and I had to disassociate mm -hmm. from my crazy family so that I wouldn't make the same mistakes that I mm. saw like mom, for instance, making. A little hurtful, but no, okay. really though, I did not. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Okay. So now grandma has passed away. What happens? What is the catalyst for you to be like, okay, let's paranormal mm -hmm. it up? Well, the funny thing is, Grandma died, and then she came to me in a dream. Mm. And so I feel like she kind of introduced herself to me in spirit, like right after she died. That's the cutest thing in the entire world. Like she was saying, so, baby, I'm not gone. Yes, I'm not gone. I'm still here for you. And so that to me was comforting because now I was like, all right, if I open myself up to spirit, I have grandma on the other side. Mm. And grandma is not going to let anything happen to me. Otherwise, without someone like grandma, I think my rational mind would be like, I don't know who you are. I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm not going to open myself up without some sort of guard at the door. Right. Mm -hmm. And to me, grandma was the guard at the door. So then I remember distinctly after grandma had died, you were at my house mm -hmm. and we had taken out the Ouija board and we were going to, quote unquote, mess around with the Ouija board. We were going to try to get some answers from spirit. I think I mean, I always was pressuring you to play with spirit. With me. I mean, to <laughs> you be were completely honest, me. I was like, can you can you can we play? I know, but <laughs> like, you can be a little too forceful. Mm hmm. This time I broke you down. I was like, get your hands on this. <laughs> we had the Ouija board out and we wanted to talk to grandma. We wanted to talk to grandma. And I remember I was looking at the Ouija board and I was sitting across from you at my kitchen table and I heard grandma laugh in my head. I heard her laugh and she said, you don't need that. You girls put that away. You don't need that. Well, that's comforting because in life, if she saw us playing with the Ouija board, we would have got our asses kicked. <laughs> like for that's sure. True. So that's nice that she was all like, oh, yes, because in life she'd be like, get You're the right. matches. You're right. We're burning it. Right. <laughs> so she then proceeded or I don't I don't even know how it happened, Jill, except that I started to have a mediumship experience and. What did that look like? I know you're going to ask me, so what did that look like? Well, here's what it looked like. <laughs> I had a vision in my head of grandma let, like bringing people to me, and the people were telling me things, and I was just saying what the people were telling me. Mm -hmm. And, and who, who were these people? Friends of yours. Friends of yours were coming through to me, and um, one of them, Justin – Right? Jason or Justin? Jason. I have a lot of people that died yeah. on the other side. So absolutely. They were my friends and they were taking advantage of the fact that Jennifer was was in spirit. Right? Yes. Yes. And I remember I, I knew that you had a friend who died named Justin. Correct. But I was getting the name Jason. Mm -hmm. in my which head just which happens to me. be yes because jason and justin were brothers and yes. it said there was a jason still alive yes there's a justin dead yes. but what jennifer didn't know is that i had a very good friend a co-worker that had recently died named jason and the funny thing was i was confused and i was saying to myself jennifer this is not real you're wrong this can't be right because jason is alive i know mm -hmm. jill had a friend named justin who died but jason his brother is still alive but the guy in my head kept saying jason i'm the kid i'm the kid and i kept thinking no no justin was a kid when he died but i remember I'm saying goosebumps that. even like thinking this because <laughs> let me tell you guys my friend jason 
that I worked with would sit in front of me and we had the same job and I would call him the kid because he's he was like three months younger than me and I would just call him the kid. I'd be like, hey, kid. And he'd be like, wait, or he'd be like, Jill, why do you call me kid? And I was like, because you're the kid. You're the kid of all kids. And so that's like his nickname. I would call him the kid. So the fact that Jennifer was picking up on like this whole narrative that like I didn't explain to her my conversations never. with my coworkers. Right. Yeah. I never knew any of that. And that was like the start of and then other people started coming through and you were like validating. And mm-hmm. I wasn't even in a spot. It was almost like I was in a like semi meditative state. I was focused on who was coming in and I was just saying what was coming out and I was trying to make sense of it. Um, but that was the beginning and I, I couldn't believe I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. <laughs> so in that process, so in that process were you weren't even even though these extraordinary messages and i say extraordinary just because you didn't know them were coming through to you yeah. were you like a believer were you like sign me up i am a total psychic right now like what was that <laughs> what did how did what was the takeaway from that experience i guess the takeaway was oh my god this is like this is real jill's jill's not crazy like this really <laughs> can happen not for that reason you know what I mean? This <laughs> this is real for me. This is something that is actually uh, something that I can do. Mm. Okay. So now you are essentially more open after that experience, yes? Yeah. After the experience in your kitchen and I yeah. browbeat you into mediumship. Now, how, from that moment, how did you using or you engaging with spirit – develop after that because that was extraordinary for you so now moving forward how did it look I think it looked like I think our relationship yours and mine changed a little bit because then I was open to quote-unquote playing with you do you know what I mean like (laughs) yeah yeah like playing with the going to cemeteries yeah going to cemeteries Mm -hmm. um I mean I will say we did that spell though before grandma died we were desperate. Right. Yeah. Uh, we but I never thought desperate. it was going to work. <laughs> oh, I like I knew like it felt like a movie. Like it felt like it was going to work anyway. But that just even that experience seems so extraordinary, like so out of the norm mm-hmm. because we were so mm-hmm. desperate. It was so charged yeah, that I don't think that I, I honestly felt like I couldn't repeat that. It felt it felt like an anomaly. It did. It felt like the exception, not the mm-hmm. norm. Doing, that, doing spell, that spell, even though it was really powerful. That, that, mm-hmm. net, that uh, what is the word? Harmful, caustic person out of our lives when we did that spell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then moving from your kitchen that afternoon after grandma died and yeah. you're surrendering, did it become the norm for you to engage in spirit? I think more and more so. I think I started to, once I, once I opened my mind to the possibility that it was real for me and that it was really Mm -hmm. happening for me. I think it made me more curious. And it also, again, the fact that I had grandma as my protector in that space made it safe. Got it. Do you ever use this awareness to bring joy or, uh, as you put it, self-soothing or some way to help you along, some way to enrich your life. Yes. Yes. I do find that I need it. Mm. I need it. I need those meditative moments. Meditation with for me is not easy. It's not easy for me to still my brain. But if I'm moving, like if I'm running – Specifically in nature, if I can run through the forest in the forest preserve, if I can walk through the forest um, or through other nature area, um, that really helps me get into that state of meditation where I feel like I can communicate with spirit more easily. Also, I found that other activities can also get me in that state, even shopping, even when there are people around me, like going Mm -hmm. through the racks, like, you know, I love Goodwill and they have those long racks, just like moving the clothes, like hanger to hanger, shh, shh, 
sh- you know, like that, that will get me in a meditative state. Um, I love, love, love going to historic places. Obviously, we do that for the podcast. But even before the podcast, I've always loved yeah. going to historic sites because I love feeling that energy. And I've always be I've always been able to feel that. Um, but I never attributed it to a supernatural type thing until more recently. Other are there other things that in hindsight you're like, oh my God, that was totally spirit. Now that you mention it. I, over the years, have de- developed this way to remain stoic when I'm stressed or scared to be able to fulfill the task in front of me. And um, like, I remember dad used to say that I was brave. I don't remember being brave. I just remember being able to focus and almost disassociate my consciousness from myself in the moment. Mm. My next question to you is now that you are working on the podcast and honing in on your gifts, has the perception of yourself changed at all? Oh my gosh. You know what's changed? Not so much the perception of myself, but up until the time that I really started to develop, to believe in that part of myself and develop that part of myself, my life goals were different. Ooh. My life goals were more about achieving a certain level of education, a certain level of material status, or just sort of, yeah, you know. Comfort. Not comfort, well, maybe comfort. But it was more material based. There was all the there's that fear of poverty that I have when you grow up eating old baked goods out of a garbage bag because you don't have dinner mm-hmm. like that. That'll stay with you. In buckets, we said we fought over who got the good bucket. We have so many funny like, you know, poor stories. Funny poor stories. <laughs> it builds character. <laughs> but after starting to develop this part of myself. I'm really more focused more than ever before on my spiritual development. People would describe us as me being more extroverted, you being more introverted. That's true. Do you think that the way we engage in spirit or use spirit is different because of that? Yes, yes, and yes. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) I feel like you are always on. Hmm. You are always on. You are always welcome to receiving messages from spirit. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like my wall is up. My chakras are closed tight. (laughs) They lock down. If I'm like, I, I'm not that person. I'm not open all the time. I feel like I have to manually, manually, like, and intentionally open myself up and say, okay, spirit, I'm ready for you now. And I think that's one of the reasons why tarot appeals to me. I was going to get there. Okay. I was tell me. Okay, so if you were going to pick what um modality or what instrument you use to um to explore spirit and to work with spirit, what would it be and why do you enjoy it? It would be tarot. Mhm. Is my that's the the method of quote unquote divination that yeah. I am most drawn to. And I think one is because when I open up my cards, there's kind of a ritual there and I'm telling spirit, okay, I'm opening up for you now. This is time for you to communicate with me. That's that's one reason. Love. Another reason is because I'm very visual. I'm a very strong visual person. And so I love the visual symbols on the cards. If you were going to speak to someone who is in later years, they're not in like teens or 20s, and they think that maybe they're past their opportunity to be aware, become aware of a spirit, what would you say to those people and is there any way you would guide them into a more a more aware space for them to receive spirit? I think 
like me, if you reflect on moments in your life, you can probably pinpoint moments when spirit interacted with you in your life in hindsight, even if in the moment you didn't know it. Developing that awareness, I really do think that you need those quiet moments and you need moments away from those left brain activities that most of us do every day, just in our work and our jobs. So I think you need to get away from those moments and you have to get away from the screens and the electronics. Is there something that surprises you most about working with spirit that seemed to be contradictory to what you thought before? And I guess I'm leading you to the the awareness that self-discovery is the path to spirit, which seems counterintuitive. Two things to answer your question. There are actually two, <laughs> two uh, dichotomies to explore. And one is, I used to think you had to study really hard to, to become more psychic. I used to think I had to work really hard and study the tarot and memorize all of the cards and the meaning and the journey. And really, it's, it's, it's working less. I love that. Yeah, that's great. Counterintuitive to what people assume learning to communicate with spirit is. It's less of a self-discovery, but really it's weeding through yourself to get to spirit. Well, I really enjoyed myself. It's fun to get to know Jennifer James in a more intimate way. <laughs> you guys, please check us out at our website, commonmystics.net. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Common Mystics Podcast, and listen in wherever you're hearing your favorite pods. But if you happen to be listening on Apple, please leave us a positive review so other people can find us. Yay! Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jennifer. It's been fun. Good night.